Eddie Johnson here from Reactions Goalkeeper Coaching. I'm here at St George's Park again, this time with former Man City and Man United goalkeeper coach Eric Steele. Hi Eric, how are you today? Fine Eddie, as we sit here at St George's we'll have all these wonderful background noises, private planes going over. That's probably Big Sam just picking out his next private house as he's got the job. I think it's messy actually, just coming in for a bit of training. But Eric, you played in goal at a high level and you have coached at some top clubs, Manchester United and Manchester City to name just two. And you're now England junior goalkeeper coach. So tell us, what is it like to work with the likes of Sven Goran Eriksson, Sir Alex Ferguson and how does that compare to your role within the England and FA? I set up? I think I'm at the stage of my coaching career where I've enjoyed a playing career then gone into coaching which I always intended doing and what you tend to do is you look to take bits and pieces from each manager that you've worked with so I've great experiences working with them, the people that you've mentioned but I learned a lot from Sven Gorham working with him his man management skills but also then I'm working specifically this year with the under 19s so it's a question of can I use all that experience and pass it on to the relevant departments that I'm going to be working with. So for you, playing or coaching, which have you enjoyed the most? Playing was fantastic. I enjoyed a great career. You know, I had six promotions. I played from a country at schoolboy level. I'm fortunate because since I've been 18, I've virtually been involved in this sport. So if you can't play, the next best thing is to coach, which is why I coach from a very, very early age. But it's a different mentality. It's a different discipline. I think some of the goalkeepers that have played do find that hard, the transition across. But I found it easier because, as I said, I coached while I was playing. So it was a natural transition for me. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've coached Joe Hart, Ben Foster, Edwin van der Sar, David de Gea, and Jack Butland, and many, many others. Just in terms of being receptive to coaching and being great to work with, who would be your favourite and what, what stands out about them particularly? I am, and I've got to be totally honest, and people ask me this all the time, who was the best, Michael, van der Sar, whatever. And I've got people that you have mentioned there that I'm as proud of that have actually not played at the highest level as what you've just mentioned, that have had really good livings in the game. They're as important to me. The ones that you've just highlighted, the big thing about them is attitude. The winners, they want to win. And they have Schmeichel, Van der Sar, De Gea Hart, they're all winners. You know, at the different ages they're at, David at 25, Joe at 29, the winners. They've won FA Cups, they've won leagues, uh, they've played for their countries, they've captained. I think that's the biggest thing that you look at when you, you deal with the top level. But that doesn't detract from other people. You know, I work with Tom Heaton, Sam Johnson at Man United, Ben Amos. Great to see them doing what they're doing in terms of leaving Man United and, and having a good career in the game. I have a question from the father of one of my students, a 10-year-old goalkeeper. Uh, in your opinion, is there one thing above all others that might make a difference between success or failure at academy or early apprenticeship level? Is it purely natural ability? Or can height, build, enthusiasm, athleticism, or even attitude make a big difference? I think that depending upon what age they join, the one big issue that I have is that there's not enough fun still involved. It should be enjoyable. When they join at eights, if they're going at eights, nines, and tens, for me, it's about enjoying the environment that they're in. Seeing if they want to be goalkeepers. You know, we've got a lot of stories of people that played in goal from when they were nine, or they played in goal like Edwin didn't start he was 14. David De Gea only ever wanted to be a goalkeeper. So you have to say, when they join these academies, I think in the early stages, I think the importance of enjoyment, and that's really down to the coaches, creating the correct environment. Inevitably, as you go through that system and you start to get to the 15, 16 years of age, which is when decisions are made, whether they'll be kept on, I think you're looking at a different um, criteria then. And unfortunately, you would have to say height does come into it. You've got responsibilities now as a goalkeeper. Yes, your prime objective is to keep the ball out of the net, but they've got to be part of the team. They've got to be able to communicate, be a coach on the field, distribute the ball. So the role of the goalkeeper has changed. But in the end, unfortunately, when you get to that age group, at the top end, as I would call it, people do look and say, is he going to be big enough? I always say to goalkeepers, are you going to be good enough? And that brings them into different territories. So you've got to be able to recognise what individual goalkeepers have got and depending upon the environment, that's the skill of the coach. What are your opinions on parental sideline protocol? I think they've got it right within the community scheme. If they're a chartered club, the, the parents go one side, the coaching staff go the other. I think parents have to be part of the process. I always believe in a triangle, coach, parent, player. If you involve the parents in the process, I think you tend to find that the communication aspect on match day is more effective, i.e. by saying, look, we don't want you screaming and shouting at your kids. Encourage, by all means, have the odd positive thought, have the odd positive word, 
but we want to try and say, look, you've got to let the kids play. That the balance has to be struck. If you actually ask the player in front of the parent and the coach what you don't want, I think that's normally a very good answer. The kids don't want to hear a lot of noise, background, etc. If you've not worked the kids and enjoyed working with them and coached them and not done enough, there's something wrong with the coach. Same as the parent. You've brought them in the car, you pick them up, you'll drop them off. You've done your job. Now let the kid go and play. And that really is the message I always try to get across. So with that in mind, what's the single best piece of advice you could give to a young keeper just starting out? Enjoy being in goal. That's your first and foremost job. And then start to develop understanding with your teammates. But enjoy it if you're starting out. It doesn't matter what level, what age, that enjoyment factor I keep coming back to. You only enjoy in a good learning environment. So choosing the club, uh, you don't want to join a club that's going to mean a 40 mile round trip for dad if you can get a local club. And then, like I say, go along and enjoy. That is the paramount for me. So in the modern game, how much importance should be placed on keepers' outfield skills in a sort of a percentage of coaching per week sense? Because of the back pass rule, everything changed for me in 93. So my coaching um, ethos, my beliefs changed in that whether I was at a professional club or not, I would actually spend as much time on the feet as the hands. Because really, a keeper's got to be capable in the modern game. Part of your job is, as a coach, can you give them the tools? And when you give them the tools, they're then in a position to say, whichever team I go to, depending upon what the coach wants from his goalkeeper, I'm capable of doing that. And that's what you want. You want an all-rounded goalkeeper. Younger players tend to struggle with goal kicks. Are there any magic wand pointers to improve distance and accuracy that you can give? Yeah, I've got, I've got one or two techniques I've used, but again, it's got to be, it's a repetitive practice. I always quote Johnny Wilkinson. When you look at Johnny Wilkinson playing rugby, and he's the place kicker, you look at the routine he has, that's what you have to give goalkeepers at all levels. Give them a routine. You don't give a routine to Edwin van der Sar at 40 years of age, because he's been doing it for so long. But there are basic techniques, but it is a repetitive practice, hitting through the toe and the lace and the middle of the ball, but it has to be, again, set up with good practice. That's where a coach is important. With that in mind, should keepers be penalty takers? Why not? They should be the best dead ball kickers on the field. Agreed. So if they're the best dead ball kickers on the field, why not? Kevin Pressman used to take a penalty for Chef Wed. He used to hit a penalty like a goal kick. It would go, boof, top corner. They should be, yeah. They're used to crisis situations. They're used to pressure situations. So pressure situation at one end, it's a one-on-one -on -one situation. Why not? Roll reversal, they love it. A lot of them thrive on it. But you only do it if the goalkeeper's happy. Totally agree. What are your opinions on the main differences between coaching male and female keepers, if any? The age group mix has to be right. Sometimes you do it by age, you do it by size. You can have a seven-year-old boy and a seven-year-old girl, and there could be a differential in height, size. I always believe when you do mix boys and girls, it's like an intro session, where you've got one coach who coaches one step back, and you evaluate very quickly the certain practices you can do and warm-ups, I'm sure you know, Eddie, that very quickly you can see movement patterns and a lot of the time they're very young that is the big difference because you can actually you can encourage and discourage if you don't get them group placements right so you've got to get a by age or size or level of ability assessed very quickly and then everybody can benefit if you're dealing with younger age groups up from 7 8 up to 12 13 the biggest problem with either a boy or a girl that they have is that when the ball is taken out of their reach in sight so in other words once they're very happy when the ball is in front of face in and around the midriff once you ask him to extend and take the ball in and around above the head, that's when the problems arrive. That's when they feel an insecurity. So you've got to get over that. You've got to introduce them again. Good practice is vital in terms of when they do it. But no, I, I just think, yeah, size is important. It's also physicality. You know, nowadays, I heard the report on the radio this morning, we are growing and we are bigger than we were. I think I've quoted at the conference, you know, the average height of goalkeepers now is bigger than it was 10 years ago. It's the same for girls. But again, it depends on the physicality. And I'm back to it. It's about the coaching as well. We're not going to develop good goalkeepers unless we develop good coaches. So if there's mispractice or bad practice, you can discourage boy or girl if the practices aren't structured properly. Uh, how important a role does distribution play? And where in place of a list of coaching sessions, what priority would you give distribution against any other particular practice? I think distribution just becomes part of your routine, part of your week, part of your coaching structure, your plan. You've got to be able to distribute the ball. So if it's at a younger age group, are they able to roll a ball? Are they able to side foot a ball? Then when you get into the 11 v 11, are they able to clip a ball into 40 yards? And then of course you're into the bigger age groups. Can they side on volley? Can they half volley? Are they able to use both feet? That is something I would stress. It doesn't matter what level you're at. Look to work both feet. 
so that you're given again an all-round goalkeeper for the team that you're going to be supporting. Purely from the heart, who do you reckon to be currently the best of the best? Your top three in the world. I go Neuer, De Gea and then the up-and-coming to challenge them all, Jack Butland. Oh, love it, I love it. Uh, we, we love Jack Butland. He's uh, helped us along in our coaching uh, progression uh, quite a lot over the last few years and I personally think that he is England's number one of the future. Would you agree? Definitely. Not just because I'm working with the younger age groups and I see what's coming through, but at the senior level you've got obviously now Fraser Foster, you've got obviously Jack Butland, you've got Joe Hart, and then you've got Tom Heaton who's been involved, and then below that you've got Jordan Pickford, Angus Gunn. So we've got a new generation of goalkeepers that hopefully are going to put us in good stead for the next 10-15 years. Based upon the World Cup, the one goal that was scored, which is the talking point of nearly everybody in the world, was the free kick. Gareth Bale's got that little bit of dip. Joe now would stand up, as he has done, and admit that he's allowed them hands as the balls come in. His hands are actually just dropping slightly behind his body. And in the end, it was instead of pushing it round, he pushed it into the side of it. And Joe accepts it. That's the good thing about Joe. He'll be back because he's done exactly what you'd expect. He's put his hand up. My mistake, my error. I'll put it right. And that's what he does. He'll move on. There's no way Joe becomes a, a bad goalkeeper overnight because of one goal. Joe's been a very, very good goalkeeper, a good custodian for both Man City and for the country, and he'll be back at his best, no problem at all. You've personally coached some top goalkeepers, as mentioned earlier. Mm. But in an ideal world, if you could organise a dream session for a couple of hours, who would you want from any time frame in past or present in that session and why? I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd get about 12 goalkeepers from the ones that I've coached and we'd have an absolutely magnificent two hours finishing off with games. We'd end up with an 8v8 and they'd all play in goal, they'd all play out. We'd have goalie wars, we'd do some technical stuff, we'd have little tests and competitions and in the end we'd sit down and we'd have a nice drink afterwards, enjoy it all socially and catch up because there's nothing better when goalkeepers and goalkeeper coaches get together. So you can imagine a mix of Lee Camp, Lee Grant, Ben Amos, Sam Johnson, then we'd say, go on then, you take on Edwin Van der Sar, you take on Schmeichel, you take on Joe Hart, you take on Jack Butlin. For me, that would be an absolute magnificent dream afternoon. And then at the end of it, they all sit around and they share stories, camaraderie. We'll probably have a great two hours on grass and then it'll probably be 20 hours on <laughs> in the bar or in, in a restaurant afterwards. As you well know, you get goalkeepers together, you get goalkeeper coaches together, that union does come out. So that for me would be a great afternoon. So if you can arrange it, Eddie, I'm more than happy to turn up. <laughs> I'd love to just spectate to that. But uh, let's say, um, just, just to add to that then, back in history, somebody that maybe that you haven't coached, who, w who would you have loved to have worked with? Banks. I've listened to him, I've watched him, I've met him. He's still my idol. When I was a kid, I mean, I was, I was lucky enough to be able to go to live and watch, kids won't know this guy, Lev Yashin who played for Russia, as it was then, and in the 66 World Cup when we won it. Uh, and I went to watch him at Sunderland, playing for Russia, and he used to wear an all-black kit. So he was, for, for me, people turn out to me, and I've got a picture still in a scrapbook, four-year-old, my picture next to Yashin's. He was my hero. Then Banks became my hero because of the World Cup. And then I've just followed Banks' career as I grew up. So we're, we're all going to have people that will look up and go, wow. And then I was fortunate enough that when I started playing, People like Jennings, Southall, top, top keepers for me. And then I was a great year away, you started to see some of the giants in the game. Joe Corrigan, you know, when you look at the size he had, Mervyn Day, lots of different goalkeepers that I looked at and I competed against then as well. So I admired a great deal. And of course, you go at the year of Shilton and Clements. So I've been right through all of them years. Now you go then into your next, your greats then start coming in, your Casillas, Buffon, you know, all time greats for me, Dino Zoff. And I've been fortunate to either see them live or watch them on a TV, learn from them. And a lot of the coaching that I've got has come from what I had as a player to when I've watched and worked lucky enough alongside some of them people, but also then studied them. And that's one of the great things I say to people. It doesn't cost anything to study. It doesn't cost anything to watch on TV, to read. That's the way you develop as a coach and develop as a goalkeeper. Eric, it's been great meeting with you again. Very interesting hearing your opinions, as always. You're obviously a student of the game, but if you can leave us with one inspirational goalkeeper thought, what is it? Enjoy. Like strikers enjoy scoring. Goalkeepers are there for one thing. We enjoy keeping our team in the game, so making saves. Love it. Thank you very much, Eric. Been a pleasure. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Eddie.